Welcome back. We looked at the last few lectures at the rapid industrialization of the United States after the Civil War, the growth of the cities, and the large waves of immigration after the Civil War. In this brief lecture, I'd like to talk about reform movements during the Gilded Age, in other words, from the end of the Civil War to 1900, and when we move on to the Progressive Era from 1900 up until uh, U.S. entry in World War I, we'll look at much greater efforts to reform society. But now, even in the Gilded Age, we do see some initial attempts at reform. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Can't get rid of my allergy here. I spoke a few lectures back on the influence of Charles Darwin's uh, world-famous book on the origin of species, which came out in 1859. And in the context of industrialization, I spoke about uh, social Darwinism being used as a justification for the great inequality in society. But now I'd like to look at another aspect of it, um, the fact that uh, society also needs cooperation. Again, just to recap, Charles Darwin did not, quote, discover evolution itself, but rather uh, the process by which evolution worked, and he called that natural selection or survival of the fittest. And again, he did not write in the origin of species about human beings. He didn't address that subject uh, and left it for others to pick up. <clears throat> now, clearly applying uh, Darwinian evolutionary theory uh, to human beings leads to a major conflict with the Bible's first chapter of Genesis, an account of creation where God created the heaven and earth and plants and animals and people in seven days. Um, and initially, this caused major, major conflict with churches throughout Europe, the United States, and elsewhere. But eventually, I think it's safe to say, many Christians accepted evolution as God's way of, of, of working out the world. And we'll talk more about that topic when we get to the 1920s. <clears throat> this is just a photograph of uh, Mr. Darwin. Now, social Darwinism, what's on this slide, I talked about earlier when we were looking about industrialization. Herbert Spencer, a well-known sociologist at the time, at the time, said, well, Darwinian evolution also works its way through human society and institutions. And the process is natural selection or survival of the fittest. And that's the engine of social progress. You will recall <clears throat> in the first module of the course, you read a, a brief article in which the author claimed that this justified the great disparities in wealth in, in the United States. And a logical conclusion of this would be to support minimum government interference, or the so-called laissez-faire government. And at the same time, charity was considered bad since it, charity helped the less fit to survive. A very extreme application of social Darwinism is the eugenics movement I mentioned before, and of course, uh, culminating in the German Nazi movement. <coughs> now, another aspect, which I haven't addressed before, it's called reform Darwinism, that cooperation, not competition, promotes progress in human society. And proponents of this said, well, you can even see it in the animal world. Look at ants and other social insects, such as bees, termites, etc. Ants live in colonies, and I don't know much about uh, biology, but I do know there are different types of ants. There are the worker ants and the soldier ants and the queen, and they all work together. And you probably have seen documentaries of, of ants um, in the rainforest where they, some of them literally hold each other and they form a bridge and other ants go across them. So clearly there's uh, social cooperation 
And so proponents of reform Darwinism, of which there were many at this time, started to say, well, it's the government's role not to just stand by and let the, the fittest survive and the others just perish, but to alliver, alleviate poverty, educate the masses, a, a positive role. And this became sort of the intellectual basis of reform and the progressive movement. And we'll see when we turn to the progressive movement, there was also um, the, the Christian social gospel movement um, that helped mandate reform. <clears throat> now, social reformers, both in the Gilded Age, which we're talking about in this lecture, and later during the progressive era, which is 1900 to US entry of World War I, they almost all focused on whites living in cities. They had a blind spot, almost all of them, to blacks, the terrible condition of blacks in the United States, the racism, segregation in the South, that was almost pushed to the side by all of them, pretty much pushed to the side, nor did they focus on the plight of the Native Americans, the American Indians. So the focus was on whites in the cities, okay? Uh, a bit on farmers, we'll see later, uh, but mainly uh, whites. Now, one of the best known social reformers was Jacob Rees. Um, he was from Scandinavia. He emigrated to the United States, sort of look, not, not poor, but you know, had a little money, but he was robbed on the streets, lost everything he had, and he actually lived in extreme poverty on the streets. And so, he, um, and he was a photographer, <clears throat> and he became well known through his photographs. And the old saying, you know, a photograph is worth a thousand words, is certainly true. Now, the camera was a revolutionary new technology. We don't think twice about it now. We pick up our, our phone and we take beautiful, not only photos, we take videos and there are all kinds of filters and whatnot. The camera was just developed before the Civil War uh, in Europe. It was adapted in the United States. It was, before that, people had to draw. They had to draw or paint. There was no way to capture an image. Now, the cameras that at this time that social Reese, that uh, should be Jacob Reese used, were very primitive by today's means, but he was the first really to go inside people's homes and take photographs, and so we'll see a few of those in a minute, on how they lived. And he did that by taking the cameras, and you've probably seen these old-fashioned cameras and movies and things. It's like a tripod. The film is actually two pieces of glass with some sort of chemical between them. The photographer puts a hood over, over his uh, uh, head, and then that works fine outside to take a, a, a shot inside. The camera needed a tremendous amount of light, so an assistant had some sort of almost explosive powder that he would ignite, there'd be a big flash, and they could take photographs inside. So he was the first one to really do this, particularly among the poor. Now, he, when he was trying to move his way up from poverty, he learned how to take photographs, and he worked for the police department as a photographer, and he volunteered to go out at night with the police uh, in the poorest area of town, which must have been very dangerous, and he got to see the conditions, and he also took photographs. And again, he had lived on the street for several years, so he knew the horrendous conditions. His book, How the Other Half Lives, was an instant success. It opened people's eyes to um, poverty because people, I mean, honestly, people didn't know about much of this poverty. I mean, they hadn't really read about it in the newspapers. We'll, we'll see we talk about the progressive era, the influence of newspapers, but people just didn't know about it in their daily lives. Clearly, they didn't have television to turn on. They didn't know about, uh, uh, they hadn't certainly seen it. They may know they're poor people, etc. So how the other half lives, this book. And we'll see when we get to the 1960, there was a book. Uh, uh, well, we'll talk, talk about in detail then. 
but really woke up Americans to the many poor in the United States. They hadn't realized how poor they were. So be sure you know the title of the book, How the Other Half Lives, or The Other Half Society. Uh, this is a picture of Jacob Reese. It's like a very serious gentleman there. This is the first edition of the book. And you can see up on the top, uh, children huddled together, sleeping on the street. And we'll see a photograph of that in a minute. And down below we have uh, the apartment buildings, the tenement buildings, where they were all crowded together. <clears throat> now this is one of the many photographs in his books. Uh, here we see these are immigrants, uh, men living together, obviously very cramped conditions. Um, they are not homeless. They're working. They work in factories. Um, and when they get off, all they can afford is to live together like this and a meager diet. Now, this little better living conditions, this is a fam family, New York City. Uh, you can see they live, all of them, in a very small apartment. And you can see they also work in the same apartment. You can see the man in the front uh, cutting cloth um, and, you know, his wife would sew and whatnot. <coughs> another photo of another family inside uh, with them working in their home. And you notice the boy on the right has no shoes on. Now this is one of the most famous photographs um, uh, this is sort of an iconic image. These are boys who actually work in factories. They, uh, they run errands for the factory. They get paid. They're, and they don't, they don't have families to live with. They don't have any money. Uh, they can't certainly afford even the meager housing of the others. And they were called sleeping outside now. This is much, much worse, obviously, in the northern part of the United States where it's literally below freezing at night, many nights in the winter, and you get snowstorms. And this is one of the m most famous photographs in American history. Now, Gilded Age politics was known for corruption, massive corruption. <clears throat> there was a lot of public participation in politics. Many people were voting now. Um, you know, as we saw before, this in the South, the blacks were effectively kept from voting. But among the white men, women don't vote yet. Women don't vote until 1920. But there was a lot of participation, many, many newspapers. Um, obviously, they didn't have radio or television, so newspapers were the main way of keeping up with things. Men would go to bars, or and if there'd be a newspaper there, they could read when they bought a beer or whiskey or something like that. Uh, a lot of people talked about politics, and even the ethnic communities had their own newspapers in their own languages, and there were literally newspapers in dozens of languages in major cities like uh, Chicago or New York with many immigrants. But it was massive corruption between the business and government at all, all levels of government. This is the city government, the county government, the state government, and the federal government. Now, by 1900, people started focusing on reforming this corrupt political system. And it obviously would support the big businesses who had the money and the influence and their special interests. The focus initially was much more on the state and local government rather than the federal government. Now, Lincoln Steffens, a journalist, wrote a series of articles about corruption, political corruption in the cities. And those were put together into a very famous book called The Shame of the Cities. One of the things behind this corruption was that voters had intense political loyalty to the two major parties. Now, of course, there's great political polarization in the United States among Democrats and Republicans, that is more for ideological reasons now, you know, ideological economic reasons. It's not because the political parties are helping you find a job 
find an apartment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's, you know, for other reasons. <clears throat> the way it worked during the period we're talking about were so-called political machines were set up in the cities. And they actually served a very useful purpose for people arriving in the cities, whether the people were immigrants from Italy or wherever, or if they would just arrived from the farm, the political machines who worked for the mayor of the city, the mayor had great power, the mayor of Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, you name it. They're so, they called a machine because it was like a machine. They went out, they got people temporary places to stay. They helped them, you know, if get set up, if you will. And then, you know, if the baby was ill or something, they, you know, make sure the, the mother got some food and a blanket or, you know, was able to see a doctor or something like that. Well, in return, they would come by before, before election day and say, you know, we expect that you'll pay us back with your vote. And so, you know, the immigrants to the city, the new arrivals got, they did get services but then it corrupted the whole system because then they were obviously expected to vote for whomever they were, had helped them. <clears throat> the, there was also what's called the patronage system that would reward people who worked for the party with jobs. So if you were in the city of New York or some, you know, somewhere and you were helping the city, part of a political machine, you know, get votes, well, then you would get a job in the city nice job in the city, or at the federal level, it was in the post office. The post office, uh, which is now called the Postal Service, but the post office was by far the largest employer in the United States. Now at the Latin national level, there was almost the same number of Republicans and Democrats in Congress, so it was pretty much in balance. The North, in general, and blacks throughout the country supported the Republicans. Now, most of the blacks could, in the South could not vote because as we saw before, they had all sorts of what they, the South thought were clever means to keep them from voting, such as the poll tax, the literacy test, et cetera, et cetera. And the blacks so supported the Republicans because as you recall from your previous studies in American history, the Republicans were the party of Abraham Lincoln, who um, had led the North during the Civil War and, of course, issued the Emancipation Proclamation. <clears throat> the Democrats received their support in the South, and the whites in the South, the vast majority of the whites, and also whites in the North or the West who believed strongly in white supremacy. So the Democrats, Democratic Party at this time, was really the party of segregation and continued to be for quite a period of time. And we'll, we'll look at that as we move along in this course where the Republicans um, received the uh, vast majority of the votes of the blacks who could vote. Uh, of course, the blacks in the North could vote. And uh, <clears throat> now today we use the um, elephant as the symbol of the Republican Party and the donkey for the Democratic Party. And these were, in effect, dreamed up by Thomas Nast, who was a very, very famous political cartoonist in the 1880s and 1890s. And it's not entirely clear from his writings why he chose the elephant and the donkey, because at the time, the Republicans uh, looked as an eagle as the symbol of their party, and the Democrats um, chose a rooster. <clears throat> now we're starting to see during this period, before 1900, the very beginnings of the struggle for some sort of clean government. The federal government instituted reform to reduce patronage in the federal government, particularly the post office and elsewhere, it was felt, you know, not Every time a new president comes in, you shouldn't have the entire uh, civil service or all the civilian employees turn over, and in fact, many, many of the military employees. So they came up, they set up a civil service system, which is what we still have today. Um, and when the president 
changes or the president changes parties from Republican to Democrat or vice versa. Um, everybody in the government doesn't lose their job. And so this was set up um, through legislation and a civil service commission was set up. <clears throat> in fact, when I worked in the State Department, we had um, about 200 people whose job depended on who was in the White House. Um, these were called political appointees. Um, but throughout the federal government today, there is a list that both the Republicans and Democrats agreed on. It's slightly more than 4,000 positions in the entire federal government are um, political in the sense that uh, the president can choose who has the who is in those positions, and that goes from you know members of the cabinet such as the Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Defense that you'd expect. They're very senior advisors. Um, and it includes all of the United States ambassadors around the world, or those are among the 4,000 positions, even though <coughs> uh, about two-thirds of those ambassadorial positions are held by State Department officials, such as myself, but you have to get permission from the White House to serve in those. And so what you see when the presidency changes parties is you don't see literally millions of people losing their jobs and being replaced because you can't run a, an efficient government that way. So, and it's interesting why this happened. I mean, there was general feeling that something needs to be done, but then President Garfield was assassinated by someone who had expected that he would get a job because he had supported President Garfield and he spoke to President Garfield's people and they said, sorry, we haven't got a job for you. So he, he had a pistol in his hand. He wrapped a bandage around it. And, you know, they didn't have very good protection for President Garfield. And he went up and shot President Garfield. So people were outraged that a upset applicant for a federal job who expected to get one because he had worked for Pe President Garfield's political campaign would kill the president. So that's the genesis of the Civil Service Commission. And now not only federal government, this is true at states, this is true at the city, county level, even school districts, you know, school districts are <coughs> government entities. They have the power to tax and they have a personnel system set up. Um, so when, you know, the head of the school board changes, you know, not everybody loses their job. Now, railroad regulation, as we saw earlier, the railroads were probably the biggest business in the United States still. Obviously, they didn't have a trucking industry. There was no competition to move things around or people. So there was the potential for, and there was great abuse um, by some, almost all the railroads to, uh, to use their, their economic power to their benefit and to the detriment of society. So the Interstate Commerce Commission was set up by Congress. This still exists, very powerful, and it's the first federal government regulatory agency. In other words, a regulatory agency is there to regulate activities in the economy, um, and it has authority given to it by the Congress. Now, I mean, the, many of these, we have the Food and Drug Administration, which looks at food safety and safety and uh, efficacy of medicines. We'll talk a lot about that when we get to the Progressive Era. SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, we'll talk about that when we get to the Great Depression in 1920s, 1930s, to make sure that the stock market and the bonds and whatnot are done correctly. The, this is just a few examples. FCC, Federal Communications Commission, they regulates use of uh, the radio spectrum from radio stations to television stations to, you know, your cell phone is using part of the radio spectrum, et cetera, et cetera. We could talk about this for, for a whole hour, and I assume in your political science courses you'll go into detail on that. So this was set up as a regulatory agency by Congress. And in the case of railroads, 
The Interstate Commerce Commission said that the rates must be, quote, reasonable and just. Well, what does reasonable and just mean? Obviously, that opens it to interpretation by a judge. But the railroads must provide documentation. And what Congress did then, and they continue to do, is they use their rationale was, well, the federal government has the authority through the Constitution to regulate interstate commerce, and part of the regulation of interstate commerce um, is by setting up these regulatory agencies to, to, to regulate, whether it's the railroads <coughs> or later food safety, radio communications, whatever. And this is what's referred to as, you know, interpreting the Constitution. Um, and we'll talk a little more about that in other cases as we move along in the course. And then the final uh, reform effort I'd like to point out during this period is the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is still a law. And it's set up to prohibit monopolistic business practices, trusts, monopolies. Now, the U.S. was the first country in the world to have such legislation. That may surprise you. No one in Europe had done this. I mean, one problem we study U.S. history is we kind of tend to study it in isolation. But, you know, we often forget that many of the problems we had in the U.S., I would say most of them, were experienced by other countries. Uh, and this was, you know, uh, particularly looking at Europe or Canada. I mean, they all had monopolistic businesses, and the U.S. was sort of in the lead to at least come up with a law. Now, this law was not really implemented in the 1890s. Uh, it was passed then, but it became a much more powerful law later, and, it was, uh, and it's still being used today. <clears throat> so as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, what we're seeing now are the very, very beginning of the reform efforts to deal with some of the abusive business practices and social injustices that are concerning more and more people. And this will greatly intensify after 1900 in the so-called progressive era. Thank you.